Marquette's Rebellion was a revolt in Norfolk, England during the reign of Edward VI, largely in response to the enclosure of land. It began at Wyndham on 8 July 1549 with a group of rebels destroying fences that had been put up by wealthy landowners. One of their targets was yeoman farmer Robert Kett who, instead of resisting the rebels, agreed to their demands and offered to lead them. Kett and his forces, joined by recruits from Norwich and the surrounding countryside and numbering some 16,000, set up camp on Mousehold Heath to the northeast of the city on 12 July. The rebels stormed Norwich on 21 July and on 1 August defeated a force led by the Marquis of Northampton that had been sent by the government to suppress the uprising. Kett was captured, held in the Tower of London, tried for treason, and hanged from the walls of Norwich Castle on 7 December 1549. Background to the Rebellion The 1540s saw a crisis in agriculture in England. With the majority of the population depending on the land, this led to outbreaks of unrest across the country. Kett's rebellion in Norfolk was the most serious of these. The main grievance of the rioters was enclosure, the fencing off of common land by landlords for their own use. Enclosure left peasants with nowhere to graze their animals. Some landowners were forcing tenants off their farms so that they could engross their holdings and convert arable land into pasture for sheep, which had become more profitable as demand for wool increased. Inflation, unemployment, rising rents and declining wages added to the hardships faced by the common people. As the historian Mark Cornwall put it, they could scarcely doubt that the state had been taken over by a breed of men whose policy was to rob the poor for the benefit of the rich. Uprising at Wyndham, Kett Rebellion, or the Commotion Time, as it was also called in Norfolk, began in July 1549 in the small market town of Wyndham, nearly 10 miles southwest of Norwich. The previous month there had been a minor disturbance at the nearby town of Attleborough where fences, built by the Lord of the Manor to enclose common lands, were torn down. The rioters thought they were acting legally, since the king had issued a proclamation against illegal enclosures. Wyndham held its annual feast on the weekend of 6 July 1549 and a play in honour of St. Thomas Becket, the co-patron of Wyndham Abbey, was performed. This celebration was illegal, as Henry VIII had decreed in 1538 that the name of Thomas Becket should be removed from the church calendar. On the Monday, when the feast was over, a group of people set off to the villages of Morley Street, Botolph and Heather set to tear down hedges and fences. One of their first targets was Sir John Flowerdew, a lawyer and landowner at Heather Set who was unpopular for his role as overseer of the demolition of Wyndham Abbey during the dissolution of the monasteries and for enclosing land. Flowerdew bribed the rioters to leave his enclosures alone and instead attacked those of Robert Kett at Wyndham. Kett was about 57 years old and was one of the wealthier farmers in Wyndham. The Ketts had been farming in Norfolk since the 12th century. Kett was the son of Tom and Marjorie Kett and had several brothers, and clergyman Francis Kett was his nephew. Two or possibly three of Kett's brothers were dead by 1549, but his eldest brother William joined him in the rebellion. Kett's wife, Alice, and several sons are not recorded as having been involved in the rebellion. Kett had been prominent among the parishioners in saving the parish church when Wyndham Abbey was demolished and this had led to conflict with Flowerdew. Having listened to the rioters' grievances, Kett decided to join their cause and help them tear down his own fences before taking them back to Heather Set where they destroyed Flowerdew's enclosures. By bearing a confident countenance in all his actions, the Vulgars took him to be both valiant and wise, and a fit man to be their commander. Sir John Hayward, Life of King Edward VI The following day, Tuesday 9 July, the protesters set off for Norwich. By now Kett was their leader and they were being joined by people from nearby towns and villages. A meeting point for the rebels was an oak tree on the road from Heather set to Norwich. 
Known as Ketz Oak, it has been preserved by Norfolk County Council, and a new plaque was unveiled in 2006. The oak became a symbol of the rebellion when an oak tree on Mousehold Heath was made the center of the rebel camp. But this oak of reformation no longer stands. Mousehold Camp Ket on his followers camped for the night of the 9th of July at Bothorp, just west of Norwich. Here they were approached by the Sheriff of Norfolk and Suffolk, Sir Edmund Wyndham, who ordered them to disperse. The response was negative, and the Sheriff retreated back to Norwich. Next the rebels were visited by the Mayor of Norwich, Thomas Cott, who met a similar response. The following night the rebels camped at nearby Eatonwood and then, having been refused permission to march through Norwich to reach Mousehold Heath northeast of the city, crossed the river Wensum at Helsden and spent the night at Drayton. On Friday 12 July the rebels reached Mousehold, where they had a vantage point overlooking Norwich, and set up the camp that was their base for the next six and a half weeks. The camp was the largest of several rebel camps that had appeared in East Anglia that summer. The rebels were known at the time as the Camp Men, and the rebellion as the Camping Time, or Commotion Time. Ket set up his headquarters in St. Michael's Chapel, the ruins of which have since been known as Ket's Castle. Mount Surrey, a house built by the Earl of Surrey on the site of the despoiled St. Leonard's Priory had lain empty since the Earl's execution in 1547 and was used to hold Ket's prisoners. Ket's council, which consisted of representatives from the hundreds of Norfolk and one representative from Suffolk met under the Oak of Reformation to administer the camp, issuing warrants to obtain provisions and arms and arrest members of the gentry. According to one source the Oak of Reformation was cut down by Norwich City Council in the 1960s to make way for a car park, although Redgroves wrote in the 1940s that had already been destroyed. The camp was joined by workers and artisans from Norwich, and by people from the surrounding towns and villages, until it was larger than Norwich. At that time the second largest city in England with a population of about 12,000. The city authorities, having sent messengers to London, remained in negotiation with the rebels and Mayor Thomas Codd. Former Mayor Thomas Aldrich and preacher Robert Watson accepted the rebels' invitation to take part in the council. Once the camp was established at Mousehold the rebels drew up a list of 29 grievances, signed by Ket, Codd, Aldrich and the representatives of the hundreds, and sent it to protect a Somerset. The grievances have been described by one historian as a shopping list of demands but which nevertheless have a strong logic underlying them, articulating a desire to limit the power of the gentry, exclude them from the world of the village, constrain rapid economic change, prevent the over-exploitation of communal resources, and remodel the values of the clergy. Although the rebels were all the while tearing down hedges and filling in ditches, only one of the 29 articles mentioned enclosure. We pray your grace that where it is enacted for enclosing that it be not hurtful to such as have enclosed saffron grounds for they be greatly, chargeably to them, and that from henceforth no man shall enclose any more. The exemption for saffron grounds has puzzled historians. One has suggested that it may have been a scribal error for sovereign grounds, grounds that were the exclusive freehold property of their owners, while others have commented on the importance of saffron to local industry. The rebels also pray ed, that all bondmen may be made FFRE for God made all FFRE with his precious blood shedding. The rebels may have been articulating a grievance against the 1547 Act for the punishment of vagabonds, which made it legal to enslave a discharged servant who did not find a new master within three days though they may also have been calling for the manumission of the thousands of Englishmen and women who were serfs. The truce between the city and the camp was ended on 21 July by a messenger from the King's Council, York Herald Bartholomew Butler, who arrived at Norwich from London, went with city officials to Mousehold, proclaimed the gathering a rebellion, and offered pardon.
Kett rejected the offer, saying he had no need of a pardon because he had committed no treason. York Herald lacked the forces to arrest the rebels and retreated into Norwich with the mayor. Kett on his followers were now officially rebels. The authorities therefore shut the city gates and set about preparing the city defences. Fall of Norwich Kett was now left with a decision. He would not, probably could not, disperse the camp, but without access to the markets of Norwich, his people would starve. It was therefore decided to attack Norwich. In the late evening of 21 July 1549, a rebel artillery positioned on and beneath Mount Surrey, the heights opposite the Bishop's Gate Bridge, at the top of which now stands a memorial to the rebellion, opened fire. The bombardment and the response from the city's artillery entrenched next to the bridge and around the cow tower lasted through the night. At first light on the 22nd of July, Kett withdrew his artillery. The city defenders had repositioned six artillery pieces in the meadow behind the hospital and were laying down such an accurate fire that the rebels feared the loss of all their guns. Under a flag of truce the rebels demanded access to the city, which the city authorities refused. Kett's artillery, now on the slopes of Mousehold Heath, opened fire on the city. The guns in the hospital meadow could not reach far enough uphill to return the fire. At this point an assault began, ordered by Kett or perhaps by other rebel leaders. Thousands of rebels charged down from Mousehold and began swimming the Wensum between the Cow Tower and Bishop's Gate. The city defenders fired volleys of arrows into the rebels as they crossed but could not stop the attack. A running battle ensued. In the market square the York Herald tried to address the rebels, but as threats were made against him he fled in fear of his life. England's second city was in the hands of a rebel army. Kett's demands, 1. We pray your grace that where it is enacted for enclosing that it be not hurtful to such as have enclosed saffron grounds for they be greatly chargeable to them, and that from henceforth no man shall enclose any more. 2. We certify your grace that whereas the lords of the manors have been charged with certain free rent, the same lords have sought means to charge the freeholders to pay the same rent, contrary to right. 3. We pray your grace that no lord of no manor shall common upon the common. 4. We pray that priests from henceforth shall purchase no lands neither free nor bond, and the lands that they have in possession may be let unto temporal men, as they were in the first year of the reign of King Henry VII. 5. We pray that all the marshes that are held of the King's Majesty by free rent or of any other, may be at such price as they were in the first year of King Henry VII. 6. We pray that reed ground and meadow ground may be at such price as they were in the first year of King Henry VII. 7. We pray that all bushels within your realm be of one stissa, that is to say, to be in measure eight gallons. 8. We pray that priests or vicars that be not able to preach and set forth the word of God to his parishioners may be thereby put from his benefice, and the parishioners there to choose another or else patron or lord of the town. 9. We pray that the payments of castle ward rent, blanche farm, and office lands, which hath been accustomed to be gathered of the tenements, Whereas we suppose the lords ought to pay the same to their bailiffs for their rents gathering, and not the tenants. 10. We pray that no man under the degree of a knight or a squire keep a dove house, except it hath been of an old ancient custom. 11. We pray that all freeholders and copyholders may take the profits of all commons, and there to common, and the lords not to common nor take profits of the same. 12. We pray that no feodary within your shores shall be a counsellor to any man in his office making, whereby the king may be truly served, so that a man being of good conscience may be yearly chosen to the same office by the commons of the same shire. 13. We pray your grace to take all liberty of leech your own hands whereby all men may quietly enjoy their commons with all profits. 14. We pray that copyhold land that is unreasonable rented may go as it did in the first year of King Henry VII. 
and that at the death of a tenant, or of a sale the same lands to be charged with an easy fine as a capon or a reasonable sum of money for a remembrance. 15. We pray that no priest shall hold no other office to any man of honor or worship, but only to be resident upon their benefices, whereby their parishioners may be instructed within the laws of God. 16. We pray that all bondmen may be made free, for God made all free with his precious blood shedding. 17. We pray that rivers may be free and common to all men for fishing and passage. 18. We pray that no man shall be put by your feudatory to find any office, unless he holdeth of your grace in chief, or capita above ten by year. 19. We pray that the poor mariners or fishermen may have the whole profits of their fishings such as porpoises, grampuses, whales, or any great fish so it be not prejudicial to your grace. 20. We pray that every proprietary parson or vicar having a benefice of ten or more by year shall either by themselves, or by some other person teach poor men's children of their parish the book called the Catechism and the Primer. 21. We pray that it be not lawful to the lords of any manner to purchase lands freely, and to let them out again by copy or court roll to their great advancement, and to the undoing of your poor subjects. 22. We pray that no proprietary parson or vicar, in consideration of avoiding trouble and lawsuit between them and their poor parishioners, which they daily do proceed and attempt, shall from henceforth take for the full contents of all the tents which now they do receive. But 8. 23. We pray that no lord, knight, esquire, nor gentleman do graze nor feed any bullocks or sheep if he may spend forty pounds a year by his lands but only for the provision of his house. 24. We pray that no man under the degree of word missing shall keep any conies equals rabbits upon any freehold or copyhold unless he pale them in so that it shall not be to the common's annoyance. 25. We pray that no person of what estate degree or condition he be shall from henceforth sell the awardship of any child, but that the same child if he live to his full age shall be at his own choosing concerning his marriage the king's wards only except. 26. We pray that no manner of person having a manner of his own shall be no other lord's bailiff but only his own. 27. We pray that no lord, knight, or gentleman shall have or take in form any spiritual promotion. 28. We pray your grace to give license and authority by your gracious commission and your great seal to such commissioners as your poor commons have chosen, or to as many of them as your majesty and your council shall appoint and think meet, for to redress and reform all such good laws, statutes, proclamations and all other your proceedings, which hath been hidden by your justices of your peace, sheriff, feudatories, and other your offices, from your poor commons, since the first year of the reign of your noble grandfather King Henry the Seventh. 29. We pray that those your offices, which have offended your grace and your commons, and are so proved by the complaint of your poor commons, do give unto these poor men so assembled for d. every day so long as they have remained there, 